Beautiful, exquisite, precious. The art of the Khmer people. More than 1,000 years ago, Cambodian artists produced masterpieces of timeless beauty. But beauty comes at a price. These are the temples that hardly any tourists get to see. Looted, plundered, destroyed. In the 1970s, antique dealers exploited the chaos of the Cambodian Civil War to go on lucrative raids. In Khor Kher Temple at that time, one of the most beautiful statues was cut off its pedestal. Lost for decades, the stolen masterpiece has now turned up again in New York, in an exclusive auction house's catalogue. Sotheby's is expecting a price of two to three million dollars. It's the most expensive and controversial Khmer auction of all time. Tess Davis, an American lawyer, is trying to get the statue returned to Cambodia. In doing so, she has taken on a powerful opponent. It's not going to be an easy case. Sotheby's is a major international corporation, a very rich international corporation. It's made a lot of money selling stolen art for many countries like Cambodia. And it's using that money now to defend itself as best it can. It's not just about this one statue. We go on the trail of the international art mafia, which generates billions with shady dealings. Our search for clues begins in New York. The arrival of a thousand-year-old sandstone warrior from the Cambodian jungle has caused quite a stir here and called the top investigators into action. We're on our way to a special department at the Ministry of Homeland Security. We have an appointment with an investigator who is trying to shed light on the scandal. Special Agent Hayes has put a stop to Sotheby's auctioning the million-dollar statue, while his team investigates his heritage. So, Special Agent Hayes, it doesn't uh, happen very often that an uh, auction at Sotheby's is stopped. You did it. Why did you? Uh, it's actually not as unusual as you think. Uh, believe it or not, there is a large marketplace for cultural property and antiquities in a sort of underground black market here in the United States. Collectors who appreciate pieces that belong to others. And so when we find out those situations, we move quickly. There's no question that the proceedings in this case could set a precedent, not just here in the United States, but internationally in terms of how pieces that are moved are viewed, at least by courts here in the United States. There's so many unanswered questions right now. And that's why these court proceedings are so important, and they really may impact the providence and the future of pieces worldwide. The special investigators take the theft of antiquities very seriously. They're putting it on a par with drugs and arms smuggling and human trafficking. The US authorities have ordered stolen art treasures to be returned to the countries of origin on several occasions. When they saw it in Sotheby's catalogue, Khmer experts warned the authorities that the statue was probably stolen. For the time being, a district judge has forbidden the auction house from selling it or taking it out of the city. And US attorneys have brought civil legal action to recover the statue and return it to Cambodia. Our next stage of the investigation takes us to Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia. In a country ravaged by civil war, the struggle to have stolen art treasures returned is a matter of national honor. Tess Davis, the lawyer and anti-smuggling activist, advises the Cambodian government. In Phnom Penh's archives, 
she's seeking evidence to prove that the statue and others like it has been stolen. She has published an article showing that in New York alone, Sotheby's has sold 377 high-caliber Khmer artworks within 13 years. Most of these have no proper documents outlining the artwork's ownership histories. The auction house unsuccessfully tried to stop Tess Davis from publishing the article. Sotheby's wanted to sell this single statue for $3 million. What makes it so, so worthful? This statue, the, the Duryodhana, um, is very unique, not just in Khmer art, but in, in international art. Um, it is part of a probably nine-figure tableau um, that would have been recreating one of the more famous battle scenes from the epic, the Mahabharata. Um, and if you think back through, through art history, to have a three-dimensional fight scene, it's, it's very unusual. All nine figures disappeared from the temple. Once, they might have looked like this. The central character is the Sotheby's statue, the king's son, Duryodhana. His nemesis, Bhima, faces him, and their followers kneel below them. It's a 3D action scene, a highlight of Khmer culture in the 10th century. There's uh, some internal correspondence that's come to light from the trial in which Sotheby's was pretty much admitting that one of the reasons the price was so high on this piece is that pieces like this aren't coming onto the market anymore. Um, of course, that's because Cambodia's, the war is over and the sites are better protected now. Um, but it's so. tough that they tried to sell it anyway, if they knew it, huh? They were warned um, that it had been stolen. Um, those were actually the exact words used, definitely stolen, uh, from Cocare. And yeah, despite this, they put it on the front page of their, <laughs> their most prominent catalog uh, for Asian art of the year. I think greed makes people do some stupid things sometimes. We set off for the scene of the crime in northern Cambodia. The Kolkhair Temple complex is located in the jungle far beyond the world famous Angkor Wat. It's a magical and mysterious place. 1,100 years ago, King Sheavarman IV built the capital city of his Khmer kingdom here. The seven-tiered pyramid was the power center, surrounded by over 40 temples and sanctuaries. Kokhair's master builders and stonemasons were regarded as the best of their time which is where the problem begins. Masterpieces of Khmer culture hold an irresistible appeal for art thieves and bandits. Everywhere we go, we encounter remnants of the temple's looting. The security guards have little left to guard. As a child, I often played over there by the great temple. The statues were still there. They had arms as big as ours. Later, they all disappeared. Nobody knows where to. Of course, the whole country went to pieces. Today, I'm a temple guide, but not many people come here. There's nothing to see, of course. Nothing but junk lying around everywhere. For those seeking to admire the splendor of Khmer culture, Angkor Wat is about 100 kilometers away. The famous temple is a world heritage site and one of Cambodia's major sources of income. New research has revealed that a metropolis of up to one million people existed here 1,000 years ago. The Cambodian archaeologist, Pipal Heng, is an expert on daily life in the Khmer age. Uh, so we have any big major of 
I'm sure you heard about the Sotheby's case, that Sotheby wants to sell Duria Dharma from Cocair for around $3 million. What are your feelings about this when you, hear, when you heard it? I mean, we, we heard of, of people um, going around collecting artifacts and um, sell them to, to the market. In, in Cambodia, I don't think many people know the international price of those artifacts. But to hear that those looted statues were sold for millions of dollars and those artifacts being looted from me, it just, I think it's just not unacceptable. Whoever is responsible for this should feel ashamed of, ashamed of themselves for doing that. For me, it, it, it's just um, unbelievable to see those outside of Cambodia. I think those should be returned because we are the rightful ownership of, uh, owners of those artifacts. Angkor Wat also fell victim to temple robbers. They continued to plunder artifacts from Cambodia's most famous tourist attraction well into the 1990s. Across the country, thousands of statues disappeared. This is what makes the Sotheby's case so important. If the New York court decrees that this one statue should be returned, many more could follow. What hard evidence do you have so far? What do you know about this statue? Well, right now we have uh, some indication from Cambodia that there's a question as to the ownership uh, and we're continuing to investigate. Question of ownership sounds so diplomatic. You mean it's, maybe it's stolen? Well, uh, the, the difficult part of conducting this interview today uh, is that it is in a legal proceeding. Yeah. And so there's a lot of things that I can't speculate on. What I can tell you is that there are definitely smuggling networks in operation throughout the world. Maybe not an organization of people working together, but organized networks where people will facilitate certain movements of pieces throughout the world. Uh, that's, provenance is questionable, and that's where we step in. In the U.S. attorney's files, we find a lot of material that Agent Hayes cannot yet talk about openly. For example, Sotheby's was informed the piece had clearly been stolen by the expert they hired to assess it. An internal email admitted that informing the Cambodian authorities about the upcoming auction would be like waving a red rag in front of a bull. Back in Cambodia, we have a meeting at the looted Koh Kher temple. The British Khmer expert, Simon Warwick, knows this place better than most. As a restorer and stonemason, he has a trained eye and was the first person to recognize the details of the looting. Where we see nothing but collapsed walls and debris, he sees the remains of pillaged temples. So that's a part of a statue? Or? Yeah, it's two parts. There's a bust here. Up here, is, you see the chest and the neck. And this is probably, well, it could be the arms, actually. I think that's the arms of a Shiva. Many of the sculptures that disappeared here now adorn private collections in the USA and Europe. It's hard to say here. It, it almost looks like there might be chisel marks there. Yes, there are here. They were, there were definitely chisel marks here. So somebody was thinking about it. Most of them are people from the village who... who uh, somebody comes and says, hey, you know, you can get a load of money if you do that. And maybe they go and have a go because they're hungry, because it was warfare until not so long ago. You can understand. Usually, the looters only take small pieces or fragments. But occasionally, they rob entire statues weighing hundreds of kilograms. In 2008, Simon made his most exciting discovery. He found a sandstone pedestal with sawn-off footstumps. 
So this is this is pretty much where they were when when we saw the, the feet the first time. Uh, and since then they've excavated this trench. That's the the lintel from above the door. This is the crime scene of the art robbery. The police have now recovered the disappeared statue's feet as evidence for the Sotheby's court case. This is the location where the world-famous ensemble of the nine life-size warrior statues once stood. The New York investigators now have a clear idea about who removed them from their pedestals in the early 1970s. In the chaos of the Cambodian Civil War, communist forces, including northern Vietnamese troops and Khmer Rouge guerrillas, controlled the entire region. Evidence suggests they helped finance their arms purchases by looting temples. The guerrillas fought in the jungle against the US Army, which was carpet bombing Cambodia. By the time the war and the Khmer Rouge's reign of terror had come to an end, more than two million people had lost their lives. In the temples, not only rebels, but also other warring parties helped themselves, reportedly often hired directly by international smuggling networks. The total collapse of Cambodia gave them a unique opportunity to go on an unrestrained looting raid. Simon guides us further around Cork Air. Here, for the first time, we get a true sense of the sheer scale of the pillaging. The remains of six of the most valuable Cambodian masterpieces are gathered in this hole in the ground. Yeah, there was a they, they were also trying to cut it here at one point. It's a matter of supply and demand. As long as museums and collectors buy temple artworks, and auction houses put them up for sale, supplies will flow from the temples. For every little, sweet little apsara that you manage to, to rip off a temple, you destroy several meters of the temple itself, which will then often collapse because there's no more support or the, the sculpture itself will, will fall to pieces because it, it was in poor condition and it gets smashed up anyway. I mean, these ones lost their, their feet, uh, most of them. So there's a lot of destruction in the whole process of looting. And by saying, oh, we need them in our museum, you're creating a market for that. So you're encouraging the process for uh, um, using that argument. So don't forget that for every um, nicely conserved, presented in a glass case with the illumination piece, there's probably another 10 smashed up sculptures lying on the ground which they failed uh, to loot. The hub for the global trade in stolen Asian treasures is Bangkok, the capital of Thailand. This is where the New York attorneys tracked down one of the alleged key people behind the murky trade in Khmer art. In their files, he is dubbed the Collector. We find video of him on the internet. Douglas Latchford, honorary president of the Thai Bodybuilders Association. Latchford has supplied museums and private collectors with high-caliber Khmer art for decades. The 82-year-old Briton cultivates his reputation as a respectable art collector. But the US attorneys accuse him of supporting a smuggling network that transported the Sotheby's statue to the West. In Cambodia, the restorer and Khmer expert, Simon Warwick, made the first breakthrough in the Sotheby's scandal. It happened rather by chance when he visited the small Cambodian town of Siem Reap. He found an important clue in the library at the French School of the Far East.
The author of this tome is Douglas Latchford. It's regarded as the standard work on Khmer culture. Critics call it a catalogue of stolen art because it openly documents final resting places of hundreds of stolen masterpieces. Cleveland, private collection, private collection. Denver, private collection. Cambodian. The highlights of Khmer culture scattered around the world. Warwick made his most exciting discovery on page 150. This statue now stands in California, in Pasadena's Norton Simon Museum. It reminded him instantly of the sawn-off feet that he had photographed in Khor Kher Temple. The size, the style, and above all the conspicuous support between its legs seemed suspiciously familiar to him. The drapery was cut, and I thought, wow, that is really similar to, to one of these. There were two pairs of feet. This one is the one that we're talking about, the Norton Simon one. This is the one that turned out to be the Sotheby's feet. So I wasn't sure which, but so I, I pulled out my computer and, and opened them up and had a look at the book and side by side, and it seemed to be really close. So I scanned the, the picture in the book. So I tried, did a simple, very childish and simple uh, Photoshop job, uh, which is, goes something like this. Put it here. And there it is, very small. Just enlarge it. Well, that's not perfect, uh, but, yeah, but we can see you can really see that there really is a case to be made. Well, I would say yeah. uh, this is uh, two points is lucky, but three points, you know, it fits in all three points. This is not scientific proof or research, but this is uh, grounds for further investigation. And eventually, that's what happened. And then uh, further investigation was carried out, and and now um, we are where we are today. Back in Phnom Penh, the Sotheby's scandal has stirred the government into action. They cannot ignore that one of the country's most famous statues is being sold by an American auction house. The government spokesman is waiting for us. He says he has a message for the world. That piece of the sandstone is the piece of a Cambrian heart and blood. We don't want to see our status like a blood status. I mean, fit or sit in the nice room and with a civilized country. It is the heart, it is the blood, it is the, I mean, the civilization that costs more money than the cost of the, I mean, during to do auction. So it is a It's $3 price. million dollars yeah. you want to sell it. This really but, is uh, a... You see that the money could come and go, but a civilization, I mean, the honors, the value of humankind more than $3 million US dollars. I wish all the cities that uh, spread out all over in the world could be come back home that we wish, and we have nothing, we have no money, but only, I mean, to turn fingers, pray, please help us, let them back home. Tess Davis, the lawyer, is leading the charge to do just that. She takes her boss, Professor Simon McKenzie, to the National Museum in Phnom Penh. Professor McKenzie is heading a research project at Glasgow University to examine art smuggling's global structures. In the museum's lobby, there's an imposing messenger of the gods. So the first statue greeting us here is the statue of Garuda from the temple complex of Kokher, the same site from which the Sotheby's statue was stolen. So as you can see, stylistically, these pieces are very unique from any others in the museum. They have a, a sense of movement and a sense of size that's just, again, very unique in the Khmer Canon. So given that we don't really know some of the things that came from Kokair, we can look at the market and we can identify some of these pieces if they have the, this characteristic sense of movement. Exactly. 
The Fighting Monkeys from Corcaire, one of the few big statues that wasn't smuggled abroad. Professor Mackenzie says Cambodia is just one of the many countries that have this problem. We ask how big the global market is for stolen cultural artifacts. If you look at the literature, you can find that there's various figures that are quoted. Um, they range up to six billion dollars um, US worldwide. A uh, year? A, a, a year in total, yeah. The market is uh, the third biggest in the world compared to uh, drugs, which is the first, and um, arms, which is, or, or human trafficking, which is the second. So you can conceive of the entire trade as being a type of organized crime in that it is a form of organized trafficking. It has powerful people who, uh, and we can talk about this, more or, more or less know you know, or suspect what's involved. Um, there are cases where there are organized crime groups who've been involved at certain stages in the trafficking, uh, and sometimes there are police seizures where you would seize um, antiquities along with drugs or along with guns, and so there's, a, there's some evidence of overlap between these transnational criminal markets. There's news in New York. Sotheby's has finally agreed to meet us, but only under strict conditions. They'll make a statement, but no questions are allowed. We meet Peter Neyman, Sotheby's lawyer, on the 46th floor of the new World Trade Center. In their prepared statement, Sotheby's are laying their cards on the table for the first time. Um, the U.S. government's position here, um, its effort to seize the statue from a good faith purchaser without compensation is unprecedented, and it is, in our view, uh, based on a misunderstanding of both U.S. law and of certain French colonial decrees issued between 1900 and 1925 that have never before been applied. But I'm happy to tell you what my view is. Okay. Um, our consigner uh, bought this statue, uh, in, or her husband did, in 1975 uh, from a reputable dealer in London in an open market fair uh, transaction where she paid a, uh, a fair market price. Um, and it was in their home for decades after that. This, says Naaman, gets the owner off the hook from a legal standpoint, as she had assumed that a reputable dealer sells only legal works. But there is no way of checking this story, as the art dealer in London no longer exists. Is there any chance to get a 1,000-year-old statue out of a Cambodian temple in a legal way? Because you say in 75 it was clear that it was a legal deal, but how do you get a statue out of a temple legally? Uh, yes, there are. I'm, I'm not going to go into great detail here. Obviously, this is a matter of litigation, but the law is quite clear that uh, under U.S. law, there must be a foreign law declaring ownership with great clarity and with no ambiguity, uh, and the laws that the government has identified uh, do not meet that legal test, and therefore we expect to prevail on that issue. But isn't it really clear? Uh, uh, that's it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. The lawyer refuses to answer any more questions. Sotheby's argument is ultimately this. Due to colonial laws, Cambodia could not prove that it was ever the owner of the treasures in its own temples. If the court accepts this argument, experts fear it will give pillagers the green light to continue smuggling artifacts from developing countries. In northern Cambodia, there is a temple whose history might undermine Sotheby's legal arguments. We are in Bantie Sre. Tess Davis shows us around. She's campaigning to have Cambodia's stolen Khmer treasures returned to the country. And Bantie Sre temple plays a crucial role in her arguments. This is because almost 100 years ago, it was the scene of an historical criminal case.
1923, a young Frenchman, Andre Malraux, his wife and his best friend, um, trekked here to this temple and hacked off a number of carvings which they were planning to sell on the international art market. Luckily, they were caught in Cambodia and the French government were able to recover these pieces. For the then 25-year-old author André Malraux and his wife Clara, Cambodia was like an adventure playground. Like many Europeans, they were enthralled by this exotic country in Southeast Asia and recognized the value of its fantastic art treasures. In an interview in 1981, his German-born wife Clara reminisced about her great love André who lost all their money on the stock market. Then he told me his plan, and it seemed totally crazy to me. But I thought, if he's keen on it, we should do it. We'd go there and find a temple that was still undiscovered, take a few of the statues, and sell them in America. I thought that was dangerous, but not uninteresting. And wasn't it, from a modern-day point of view, somewhat unfair toward the countries in question to take away artworks that belonged to them? Oh, they would never have been discovered, or only too late, and there would be nothing left there. The temple that we went to was in the middle of the jungle. But Mauro and his stolen statues fell into the police's clutches and he was put under arrest in this house in Phnom Penh. Later, he was sentenced to three years imprisonment for art robbery. The art robbery didn't harm his reputation. Ironically, André Mauro later became France's first culture minister. The court files on the Mauro case are stored in the National Archive in Phnom Penh. Mauro's arguments back then were the same as Sotheby's today. As the temple statues belonged to no one, taking them could not be a crime. But this bizarre legal argument was ruled invalid even then. In Tess Davis's view, the fact that the Sotheby's lawyers are relying on the same argument indicates their sheer desperation. I think they're fighting this case so hard out of desperation that they realize this era where they could do whatever they wanted to is over, it's ending. For example, this scene that you have at Coquere with the statues, the nine statues, the tableau at Prasetchen, it was broken apart, shipped as parts, uh, piece by piece, trafficked to Thailand and then onward to the United States eventually. And, and it was broken up, much like many families during the Civil War were broken up and scattered to the end of the earth. And I, I think it's very important that now that the war is over, now that Cambodia is recovering and coming back stronger than ever, that these pieces be reunited. It's, it's not just about art. It's, it's more important than that. Um, this is one chance for us to right um, just one of the, the many, many wrongs that happened to Cambodia. Um, during this time period. Um, and I, I don't understand why anyone would not want to be a part of that. And then the unexpected happens. Douglas Latchford, who investigators believe supported a smuggling network that transported the Sotheby's statue to the West, asks us to come to Bangkok. The art collector sees the Sotheby's affair as a threat to his reputation and wants to set the record straight in an interview. The precondition for the interview is that we are not allowed to film the right-hand side of the apartment. That is where the Khmer treasures are. It's important to Latchford, however, that we inform the world of his readiness to donate parts of his collection to the National Museum in Phnom Penh when the time is right. We ask him about the Sotheby's scandal and show him the court papers from New York. Mr. Latchford, you're personally mentioned in the, in the court files as the collector. They say that uh, you are the one who owned the Duryodhana. In, it was stolen in 1972 in Prasad Shen. You owned it, and together with a Thai dealer, you sold it to, the, to an auction house in, 
in London. What's your comment on that? I don't know where they imagined that I own the piece, but let me confirm to you first that I did not own the piece. I have never had anything to do with this tie dealer, and I did not sell it to Sphinx. There is evidence to that effect to prove that. Justice didn't work in this, in this case because my lawyers in New York, in Washington, contacted them, but there was just no response. They didn't want to hear the other side of the story. Latchford is happy to show us his art catalogue. But this is not the evidence that supposedly exonerates him. He claims a secret video proves his innocence. However, he will not show it to us for security reasons. He says it would incriminate one of the leading Thai families as big-time smugglers. We have no way of verifying his claims. How important was provenance at this time? How important was it to know where the pieces are coming from? In, at that time, in the 50s, the 60s, um, nobody questioned provenance. It didn't play a big role for you to think about where it came from? Or Not hope. from me or from anybody else. If you see a, a statue like the Duryodhana that was cut off in two or three pieces, most of them had off, torso extra, isn't it very obvious that these were looted things? Because this is the way how looters work. They cut the head off, they deliver it to... Okay. Yeah? I think you should stop and give Douglas a rest now. Yeah? As you like it, okay. I stop this, this video as well. At this point, Latchford's son-in-law, a lawyer, interrupts the interview. Okay. A little bit of your original... In the court files, they speak of smuggling networks and you being a part of a smuggling network. What do, do you feel when you, when you read it? Um, their imagination has gone wild. They've seen too many Indiana Jones films. As far as I know, there is no such thing as a smuggling network. And I certainly don't belong to any smuggling network. Experts take a different view. Local thieves, they say, looted the Cambodian temples by order of foreign dealers and collectors until the 1990s. But what about the situation today? So Tess, how easy is it to buy stolen antiquities in, in Phnom Penh? Well, right now we're going to the Russian market, which is um, the most popular tourist market here in the city and has been for decades. And while the valuable pieces, the really valuable statuary and pieces like that, never stay here in Cambodia, they're shipped off to Thailand and elsewhere, you can And get... they end up in the museums or in private collections? Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But you can buy antiquities here in Phnom Penh yeah. uh, that have been looted from sites all over the country. Uh, bronze and iron jewelry, beads, uh, bangles. With a hidden camera, we approach one of the city's well-known outlets for stolen goods. But if we take this with us to the airport, we will get problem, huh? No, it's not problem at all. Why? For what? Nothing. If you have a statue or, yeah. or stone or a paint, or maybe they look careful, but for something like this or for like for the decoration, is nothing. You can have a look inside. I saw you something. Should, should we take a look? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, why not? Yeah. One thousand six hundred. This one also one thousand six hundred for the man. This note. This note. Mm. Mm. Very beautiful for her and him and this one. And I had Naga also. Of this, that one Naga incorporate that one one thousand two hundred because it a bit damage. Dollar yes, dollar. Okay, Tess, I think we have to discuss it, huh? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. Thank How you. How much is this one? 
If everybody knows these places and the dealers, why does nobody stop them? Government resources are limited here. The government's having to fight the buying and selling of children, the buying and selling of drugs, some quite hard drugs, and wildlife, and things like this sometimes. Uh, trinkets, no matter how important, uh, sometimes slip through the cracks. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, as, as you can see, um, the pieces we were looking at today are quite small. Yeah. Um, it would be very easy to put it in your pocket and walk right across the border. There's no drug dogs that can sniff these, these items. The lucrative trade in high-quality Khmer art is done in neighboring Thailand. The premium address for dubious deals is the large, luxurious antiques mall, River City, in Bangkok. Anyone who buys temple art here has either been swindled with high-class forgeries or, in return for a lot of money, has actually acquired an original, a stolen one. There are no legal temple artifacts on the market because Cambodia has never legalized the selling of temple treasures. The price tag says that this statue comes directly from Khor Care, the temple from which the Sotheby's statue too was stolen. It costs $15,000. Not this one is uh, not a copy, this one original from Cambodia. Yeah. Okay. It's the uh, copy, it's the uh, cheaper like that, this one, not the antique yeah, one, yeah. yeah. And and you can you can ship this to, to Germany without problem? Or? No problem. We, we, uh, we will got, get no problem with no the problem. police? Uh, or... My wife, uh, many the own customer from uh, German, from America, from England, from Australia. Mm. Yeah. It's a uh, many uh, come in Thailand, yeah. How do you make it? You just send it by, by ship uh, or by I post? I ship by or? boat. By boat. Yeah. Stolen goods per mail order and a temple in the jungle as a vault for dubious racketeers. US attorneys have traced the exact trail left by the stolen Sotheby's statue. They say in 1972, the statue was removed from its pedestal in Kolkare Temple. The looters exploited the chaos of the Civil War. Then the sandstone masterpiece was smuggled across the Thai border in an ox cart and delivered to the collector in Bangkok. Together with another dealer, he forwarded the statue to Europe using false documents. In the mid-1970s, an auction house in London sold the sandstone warrior to a wealthy art collector in Belgium. Decia de Poor inherited the multi-million dollar statue from her husband. On her lavish country estate, thoroughbred horses are groomed in a museum-like atmosphere. She belongs to the Belgian upper class, and her family is entangled in various bribery and construction scandals. The media-shy millionaire refused our requests for an interview. In 2010, Disha Dapur sent the statue to Sotheby's auction house in New York. It's being held there until the court reaches its final decision. In the meantime, Sotheby's has lodged an unsuccessful objection to the application. The Sotheby's scandal has spread. During the investigations, masterpieces from Kokare Temple were identified in four US museums. One of them was the renowned Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. By sheer coincidence, Cambodia's most famous contemporary artist was exhibiting here while we were filming. Sopiap Peach's Rattan works are in demand around the world and his exhibition gives us an opportunity to obtain permission to film in the Metropolitan Southeast Asia section. Modern and ancient art side by side. This work is called Broken Buddha. The genuine historic fragments can be seen in the background. These are the two kneeling attendants that once sat enthroned in Kolkare Temple, just a few meters from the Sotheby's statue. 
They too originate from the looting of the temple. The traces of the stone milling machines are clearly visible. The museum's curator agrees to be interviewed. We ask him if he believes that masterpieces of Khmer culture belong in New York rather than Cambodia. Where they belong to, where they came from. Well, they are indeed um, shown in Cambodia. They, Cambodia has uh, uh, two very major museums, and of course, where it shows its uh, vast collections of antiquities, and of course, has, has the, the living museums of all the temples themselves. Are visited by millions every year. But no in more Angkor, statues in it Angkor. because all the statues are standing in the museums all around the world. Uh, the uh, history of the collections uh, vary country to country. Uh, uh, we take the view uh, at the Met that it's a, a, an international museum with global collection. And uh, indeed, everything in the museum comes from somewhere. Everything comes from somewhere. And this 1,000-year-old statue is quite obviously the product of an organized raid, supplied by dubious sources. Douglas Latchford donated the torso, while another collector donated the head three years before. The high society donors often go as far as to make inflated receipts, which are tax deductible. Thus, stolen art makes its way even into renowned museums. The auction houses, too, have their methods for covering up the smugglers' tracks. Tess Davis speaks of weak, submissive legislation. In the auction houses' catalogues, for example, the names of the vendors often don't even have to be specified. The antiquities market, um, and even the, the top of the antiquities market, the auction houses, considering how much money passes through them every year, um, are very unregulated. Um, if someone were looking to launder money, it would be a very easy way to do it. There's very little regulations. You can spend millions of dollars on something and not know whom you're buying it from. Where else can you do that? I don't think the public wants to own a piece of the Cambodian Civil War. I don't think they want to own a sacred object that was stolen from a temple uh, by paramilitary groups um, and perhaps funded their operations. I don't think people want that. Museums and auction houses are entangled in the scandal of the stolen group of figures from Khor Care. In the middle is the king's son, Duryodhana, now in the Sotheby's catalogue. Below right, the Pandava brothers, the kneeling attendants. Today, two of them are enthroned here, in the Metropolitan Museum. The curator, too, is rather uneasy about the statue's story. The Codes of collecting have changed through the decades. And what was perfectly acceptable um, 30, 40 years ago is not the, uh, the rules that we abide by today. Yes, uh, the manner of, manner of collecting changes over, over time. And we now follow the UNESCO conventions uh, for our, our, all our acquisitions that we make. In a surprise move, a few weeks after our interview, the Metropolitan returns the two statues to Cambodia. But the biggest shock is yet to come. In the most astonishing development of all, Sotheby's backs down. The auction house returns the stolen statue to Cambodia. In return, the US Attorney's Office in New York agrees to stop the court proceedings. The most expensive and controversial Khmer auction of all time collapses, and the greatest Khmer masterpiece is back home. It's an historical moment for Cambodia, and a great success for Tess Davis. No fewer than three statues from the world-famous group of stolen artifacts are being welcomed today with a state ceremony. As well as the Duryodhana statue from Sotheby's, its nemesis Beamer from the Pasadena Museum is back too. And to cap it all, the auction house Christie's surprises the art world by buying back a statue it has already sold, voluntarily donating it to Cambodia. Until then, not even the smuggling investigators knew that this masterpiece was also owned by a collector. This is the moment Tess has fought for for years.
This is a very, a very exciting day, and it's a great success, not just for Cambodia, but for all these countries around the world that are facing these same problems. For everyone who's been a victim of plunder, be it a nation or be it victims of the Holocaust, um, this is a victim for everyone who cares about the right thing happening, and the right thing has happened here. These belong home. <laughs> Simon Warwick, the restorer who helped confirm the theft of the statue, has also been invited to the state ceremony as a guest of honor. The returned statues are due to be presented soon in a special exhibition at the National Museum. It would be too dangerous to take them back to Corkair Temple. A small country has prevailed against powerful adversaries. It's a day of celebration in Cambodia. But not all are celebrating. Back in Bangkok, Douglas Latchford sees the matter rather differently. It's a good day for Cambodia. It's a bad day for the art market. Sok Ahn, the deputy prime minister, welcomes the returning heroes from the temple. Six of the nine stolen warrior statues from Koh Kher are now back in Cambodia. Two more are still in American museums and might soon follow. The whereabouts of the ninth statue remain unknown, for now.